Hi everyone, welcome to my video on the geology of the Boston Harbor Islands. So to provide some context, there are 34 islands and peninsulas that make up what's known as the Boston Harbor Islands National Recreation Area. Now this isn't quite a national park, however it is managed by the National Park Service. These islands provide a great escape from the hustle and bustle of downtown Boston, and they're easily accessible by ferries. There are three geologic processes that are responsible for creating the Boston Harbor Islands. The first one we'll look at are Cambrian bedrock deposits that form the bottom of the Boston Basin. Then we'll look at glacial deposits and glacial erosion from the Pleistocene Ice Ages, which created glacial till and landforms known as drumlins. Then we'll look at more recent erosion of the islands by coastal processes during the Holocene. And then we'll conclude the video by looking at three cases. So first I'm going to talk about the underlying bedrock of the Harbor Islands. As you can see here, the Boston Harbor is located in an area known as the Boston Basin. And this is a lowland of a larger chunk of continental crust known as the Avalon Terrain. A terrain is a group of rocks with similar characteristics and geologic history that formed somewhere other than their present location and were moved by tectonic forces. So the, Avalon, the rocks in the Avalon terrain, um, which are mainly soft bedrock, um, was deposited nearly 600 million years ago um, at a location much farther south from where it is today. Now, this chunk of crust actually moved, and 300 million years ago during the Allegheny orogeny, it collided with the North American continent. And this created a lot of faults, which you can see here by the yellow lines. So the Boston Basin is surrounded by these by uh, these fault lines and um, as a result of thrusting um, and rifting along these fault lines it actually caused the Boston Basin to sink and become a lowland. So next we'll take a look at the stratigraphy of the Boston Basin. So there's two parts there's the bedrock here at the bottom and then glacial till that was deposited later um, on top of the bedrock. Now the bedrock is composed of mainly metamorphosed sedimentary rocks like Cambridge Argillite and Roxbury Conglomerate. There's also some igneous intrusions with these dikes here and granite. And these bedrock outcroppings um, kind of poke through the surface at some of the islands and can be seen along island shorelines. This map here shows the bedrock geology throughout Boston Harbor. As you can see, most of the islands are formed of argillite and there's also some igneous rock mixed in. And this map shows the various faults and um, folds throughout Boston Harbor. So we have the Cathedral Fault here and then some um, anticlines, and a lot of these are responsible for creating the bedrock outcroppings that we can find in a lot of the Boston Harbor Islands. And as you can see, that, like there's an anticline that's very visible right here, um, and also some thrust faults that are very clearly defined on the islands. And these are all examples of where the bedrock is kind of sitting higher than the surrounding bedrock, and it kind of breaches the surface at the islands. So next we'll take a look at the glacial processes responsible for creating the Boston Harbor Islands. So roughly 12,000 years ago, the Laurentide Ice Sheet traveled over the Boston area. Now before this happened, there were already piles of unshaped glacial till around Boston, that had been left there by previous glacial events. And all of these unshaped mounds of glacial till already sat above the bedrock that was already there. Now, when the Laurentide ice sheet traveled over um, these mounds of glacial till, the pressure um, from the thick ice sheet essentially shaped these mounds of glacial till into streamlined, rounded, and elongated hills that are known as glacial drumlins. Drumlins have a rounded egg-like shape, however one face usually has a steeper slope than the other. Furthermore, a drumlin's axis is always parallel to the direction of the ice sheet's movement, and drumlins usually occur together in groups called swarms. Most of the Boston Harbor Islands are drumlins sitting on top of bedrock, and Boston's drumlin field is unique because it's submerged. There are only three of these in the entire world. Since the Boston Basin is a lowland, the entire area flooded when the ice sheets retreated and sea levels rose, causing the drumlins to become islands. As this map shows, most of the drumlins point in the same direction, which proves that they were shaped by the same ice sheet. The final geologic process that I'll discuss is the coastal erosion of glacial material during the recent Holocene period. 
So Boston Harbor is open to the northeast, and most of the storms that Boston gets are known as nor'easters, meaning that the wind and surf prevails from the northeast. This photo here is of Hummer Rock, Massachusetts, which is just south of Boston, and it really clearly shows the destructive erosional potential that these storms cause. Because the islands are composed mostly of loose glacial material, that makes them really susceptible to water-based erosion. When water from waves, currents, or tides are forced up against the sides of the islands, it gradually eats away at the sides of the islands and erodes them, creating a retreating bluff and an active scarp face, as seen here. Now this eroded sediment often travels along the island via onshore drift and creates sand spits along the island. Also in Boston, there's a lot of boat traffic and their wakes contribute to this erosion. So as I just mentioned, when the islands erode, longshore drift and onshore drift um, move the sediment along the island and create sand spits. Now often when there's two large, larger land masses that are both eroding at the same time, sometimes the sand spit can form in between them and actually connect them. This is called a tombolo and um, there are numerous examples of tombolos connecting drumlins in the Boston Harbor Islands. Boston Harbor has a really large tidal range. On average, it's about 10 feet. So this means that there's a lot of water moving in and out of the harbor and eroding the islands. And this will only be amplified by the predicted sea level rises over the next 30 to 40 years. So next, we'll take a look at three specific locations in the harbor, the first of which being Lovells Island, which is located here. As you can see, Lovells is exposed to the northeast, so during nor'easter storms, Lovells gets hit particularly hard. And here's a map of the island. So the formation of Lovells, it essentially started out as separate drumlins uh, that were created by the glaciers. And over time, um, coastal processes have eroded these drumlins and has connected them together um, through tumblos and sand spits. And over time, all of these drumlins have kind of converged on a central space and have trapped this marshy area in the center. So now the same erosional forces that actually created Lovells Island are now actively destroying it. On the north and northeast sides of the island, coastal engineers have constructed seawalls to help buffer the island from northeast surf and swells. However, on the northwest side, the only seawalls that are there are these three from World War II. Um, but since the island has the island's shoreline has retreated so far, these old seawalls are practically useless since they're covered at high tide. This beach here is eroding very quickly. You can see this sand dune is retreating backwards and it looks like it's almost going to collapse. Now a reason for this erosion on this beach here um, is because of the boat wakes that are directly adjacent to it. Here we have a picture of the Provincetown Fast Ferry churning up a huge wake and these waves are just going to wash on shore and erode this bluff here and uh, cause it to retreat. So next we'll look at Pettix Island which is located here. Just like Lovells, Pettix was created by kind of the combination of five separate drumlins through erosion and the creation of tombolos, which are located here. I'll also draw your attention to Hull Gut, which is located here on the northeast side of the island. A lot of water moves in and out of Hull Gut during the tidal exchanges, and also during nor'easters, this area gets heavily eroded. The last case we'll look at is World's End, which is located here. World's End is actually a peninsula, but like Pettix and Lovells, it was formed by the erosion of several drumlins and their connection through a tumbolo. In this next clip, you'll get a good sense of the scale of this landscape. Right now I'm standing at the top of a drumlin, and in front of me here you can see the smooth, kind of egg-shaped hill that slopes down gently to the isthmus or tumbolo and connects, which connects to the other drumlin on the other side. Looking at World's End is a great way to conclude this video because it has some really clear examples of all three types of geologic processes. Here's an image of an exposed bedrock outcropping at World's End, and we just discussed the drumlins at World's End, located here and here, um, that were created by the ice sheets shaping mounds of glacial till. There are also examples of glacial erratics at World's End, as well as this tumbolo sand spit that was created by the post-glacial erosion of the glacial sediments. Here are the sources I used, and thank you for watching my video.